Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, yeah, folks, it is Monday evening uh, once again, and I am back here with you on this April 6, 2020. This is episode 64 of the Grim Leftovers program. How you doing out there? Everybody doing all right? Everybody doing fine? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we're on the new stream now. Uh, I think I was on it last week, too, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to get stuff uh or I should say I am trying to get stuff uh, kind of lined up and worked out to be where it was with the old stream. Uh, I didn't really want to change streams, but uh, that, that old uh, service never never got back with me. I contacted him a couple times, and oh well, what can you do? What can you do? Uh, any, anyway, so um, I'm try, I got us, I think, hooked back to Internet Radio, uh, and uh, I'm working on the tune-in thing. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. But trying to get some of our stuff turned back on, which I have to do when I, when I change streams, you know. Uh, so, uh, oh, well, that's all right. So, anyway, howdy and hi, and welcome to all the folks out there in the various places you may be tuned in from, whether that be right here on reallibertymedia.com or over there on rlmradio.xyz. It's possible you're over there on realliberty.org. Except I think I still need to modify that radio to make it work right. And over there on freedomsnetwork.com, of course, there's a problem on freedomsnetwork.com right now with the uh, SSL cert. I've contacted uh, Bo Diddy on that, and hopefully he'll get that fixed up right quick. That would be a good thing. All right, uh, let's see. Anything else RLM news related? Uh, I don't think so. Everything seems to be going fine here on reallibertymedia.com. And uh, hopefully uh, all the RLMers are are staying healthy, uh, which I, I I say that kind of tongue in cheek because come on, <laughs> I'm not buying this Corona stuff. I'm just not buying it. It's 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 it's, it's a it's a big load of nonsense. Uh, but uh, that that that's my take. That's my view. So uh, in that vein, in the vein of that being that and. Uh, I was, like I said, uh, thinking about not doing, doing a show because of all this corona nonsense news. I had to look deep, deep into my list of stories I had saved up to see what, what I had here for you. And I got some good ones. I got some good ones lined up. Yes, I do. <laughs> all right. We're, we're we're kicking it off on a website, the uh, Evening Standard, uh, standard.co.uk. And uh, got any, wait, 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 do we do we have any flat earthers out there? Any flat earthers? <laughs> All right, here it is. Mad Mike Hughes, death. U.S. daredevil trying to prove the Earth is flat is killed. And homemade rocket crash. This article from Sunday, the 23rd of February, 2020 here. <laughs> a daredevil trying to prove the Earth is flat has been killed in a homemade rocket crash in California. Michael Hughes, who went by the moniker Mad Mike, was attempting to launch his steam-powered rocket. Steam-powered rocket. <laughs> to an altitude of 5,000 feet from a site in the desert northwest of Los Angeles, but crashed 20 seconds after takeoff. Hughes, 64, eventually wanted to prove his flat earth theory by taking photographs of the curvature of the planet, or the lack of curvature under his theory, from space. The stunt was being filmed for a science channel program called Homemade Astronauts. The program confirmed his death, tweeting, Michael, Mad Mike Hughes, tragically passed away today during an attempt to launch his homemade rocket. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his family and friends during this difficult time. It was always his dream to do this launch and 
Science Channel was there to chronicle his journey. San Bernardino Police Department has not released Mr. Hughes' identity. Uh, well, we I think we, are, we we pretty much got that already, don't we? His name is Mr. Hughes, it says right there. Mike Hughes. Uh, uh, but has confirmed that a man died in a rocket crash at 2 p.m. on Saturday. A uh, video of the launch shows Hughes' rocket arc off to the right almost immediately after takeoff with what appears to be a parachute falling away from the aircraft. The rocket then plummets, nose first, to the ground. The crash happened to be in the open desert near Barstow, a town northwest of San Bernardino. Yeah, yeah. San, uh, <laughs> San Bernardino County Sheriff Coroner uh, Public Information Officer Cindy Bachman said, a man was pronounced deceased after the rocket crash in the open desert during a rocket launch event. Medical aid was staged for the launch and was on scene immediately. Mr. Hughes had built the rocket with the help of a partner, Waldo. Where's Waldo? Stakes. And the pair were, uh, were one of three teams featuring in the Science Channel program, Homemade Astronauts. Well, there's more to the article if you care to read it, but let me just say, uh, he did not prove that the Earth was flat, but the Earth did prove that he was flat. Yes, he is flat. He's much flatter than the Earth could ever happen to be. <laughs> he's, 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 he is one flat dude. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I feel bad for the guy, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I get a kick out of that kind of stuff. So uh, there, there's uh, Mad Mike Hughes for you. Um, flat as a pancake. Uh, now, this next, this next post, I know we talked about it in the chat, uh, Pretty much um, right after I posted the link into the chat back whenever this came up. Um, uh, the thing is, the thing is, uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, hang on, I, I gotta, I gotta do something right, right quick here. Uh, uh, just to uh, try and uh, save my machine here from overheating. Van, I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so we talked about this in the chat. I know. This is posted on the Kenigma.com website on February 12th. Kenigma. And, the, and, the, and the, that title of the article is a question. And I know I saw responses in the chat um, pretty much uh, right right after uh, I, I posted the link. with people saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not a thing. I disagree, and I disagree for a number of reasons. But uh, let, let, let me let me just uh, give it to you here. Does holding cannabis smoke in longer make a difference? And immediately people were saying, "No, no, it makes no difference." I disagree. I disagree in a big, big way. I do. <laughs> Anyway, let me, let me give you a little bit of what he's got here. He says, it's conventional wisdom that has been passed down for generations and is accepted as de facto gospel among a marijuana smokers. The longer you hold the smoke in your lungs, the stronger the effect. And while holding your breath and taking uh, strong, deep inhalations can produce a stronger feeling... Research has found that the longer you wait before exhaling has no bearing on the actual absorption of THC. Nonsense! The psychotropic component of marijuana. And let me just say this about that and why I believe what I believe about all of this. Um, the, the thing is, maybe if you had some kind of weed that um, didn't expand... Uh, uh, maybe I would agree with that, but but any decent weed uh, that I've seen has, has a pretty good expansion factor to it. Um, and, and when when you if you don't allow that expansion to occur, 
then then you're you're not filling up all the alveoli there in your lungs, uh, and 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 that's that's required in order for that to get deep in there and and, and into your oxygen system. Uh, that's how it works. Now uh, let me go on here a little a little bit more of this article though. Uh, part of the popularity of smoking as a delivery method is that marijuana, uh, with marijuana, it produces an almost instant effect. Yeah, you get the buzzing pretty quick. As the smoke is absorbed into the tiny air sacs in the lungs, known as the alveoli, uh, the exposure to heat during smoking and vaping also, uh, let me take this word here, uh, decarboxylates the marijuana decarboxylates the marijuana, uh, converting the THCA to THC as the smoker pulls it into their lungs. Like with so, ma so much else involving marijuana, the key to the intoxicating effect of THC is what is known as bioavailability. This refers to how much of the substance is absorbed into the body of a living system. With THC, it is closely linked to the method of consumption, and a major part of why smoking is such an effective and popular way to consume marijuana. A 2007 article stated that, on average, THC has a bioavailability of 30% when smoked, with oral ingestion of THC, edibles and such, has an average bioavailability of only 4 to 12 percent. Another study in 1980 tested 11 health subjects, healthy subjects, who, who took THC intravenously. How the hell do you take THC intravenously? I, I, I would never want to go down that road. Smoking and by mouth. The smoking and IV were similar, but the plasma level of THC after oral doses were low and irregular indicating slow and erratic absorption with oral consumption. For CBD, the non-psychoactive cannabinoid used for treatment, uh, research has shown that the same principle applies. Smoking produces a much higher bioavailability than oral dosing. So if you can smoke your CBD, it's going to work a lot better for you. Uh, they say I'm cutting out. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Okay, well, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, if I'm cutting out, I am. I, I, it's, uh, I gotta just keep on with the show, and um, <laughs> I have no recourse to to, uh, to fix anything like that at this point in time uh, as I'm doing the show. Sorry. Um, <laughs> all right. Furthermore, a 2006 study found that a vaporizer could deliver an average of about 54% of the THC loaded into it, and that on average, 35% of inhaled THC was directly exhaled again. Uh, results that are comparable uh, to smoking. But does holding your breath actually make a difference in the effect of marijuana? Not according to these researchers. Okay, they're saying I got cut out a few times, but I seem to be good now. Thank you. All right. Um, well, this research here, a study carried out in 1989, observed eight regular marijuana smokers. Uh, and this study, if I could see here, uh, was by a government institute, the uh, uh, NLM, NIH.gov people. So you can't trust them. You can't trust them. Um, anyway. Uh, as they held marijuana smoke for a duration of 0 to 10, sec 10 to 20 seconds. The researchers tested a variety of parameters, including increased heart rate, uh, increased high, and impaired memory performance. W what are you checking that for? Uh, according to each duration and found, uh, there's little evidence uh, that the response to marijuana was a function of the breath uh, hold function. They're wrong. They're just wrong. Um, there, people are asking me questions. I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I'm, I, I just have to go on. Uh, anyway, so there, this article is basically just saying that uh, holding holding the, the smoke in your lungs longer does no good. It's that's absolutely incorrect information. Uh, and I, I can tell you that from 
many, many years of experience um, of, of smoking pot. Uh, absolutely holding holding it in. During the expansion phase of the smoke is is what gets that down deep in there, deep into those lungs of yours. Uh, and and that gets it into your oxygen system, which gets it into your blood system, which gets you high. So um, if you are a smoker of the marijuana, of the cannabis, of the weed, um, I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, hold it. Hold, hold that stuff in your lungs, and you will be... Uh, you'll get a far better high. And why? Why waste it anyway? Why? Why? Why blow out all that smoke into the air? It's just. Uh, all right. Now let me see if I can see what they're talking about here. Um, <laughs> they're saying I'm cutting out or something uh, on the on the stream. All right. I I don't know uh, if I am cutting out or not. Um, well, they say I am. Uh, one thing I can do, and this may this may interrupt the stream for a moment. But we'll go ahead and do it uh, just because we can. It'll, it'll, it'll also probably disconnect me from something else. Yeah, there it is. Okay, let's stop and then restart that. All right. Let's. Uh, I probably have to close this. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, you're not hearing me. I'm just talking to myself. But it's on. It's on the recording. So uh, uh, let, 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 let's let's try this here. Um, what's going on here? You know, am I? Am I? I, I got. I got to reload. See now. Now I'm, I, I'm interrupted. And, um, okay, stop, stop, close, open, go. Okay, there we go. All right, now let me see if that's going to work any better. It's possible the uh, server, the VPN server I was on, uh, was, was messing with something. I don't know, but it should be back now. Uh, everything should be good. So, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully that's, that's, uh, that should be the difference. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With any luck, <laughs> all right. You make sure everything's streaming. I don't even know. Oh boy. Okay. It all looks good from this end here. Uh, let, 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 let me go in here. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. It's it, it. It all looks fine. I think everything's fine. Yeah. No. We're live. We're live. Everything's good. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, everything should be back. Okay, sorry guys if it was an interruption in the stream there. Uh, you'll have to listen to the uh, you'll have to listen to the uh, podcast later. Uh, apparently, it may be, maybe the VPN server that I was on was was not working too well, so I switched. All right, from uh, April second, so not that long ago. Oh no, April second, twenty nineteen. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, a year and not that long ago. <laughs> From TakeBackYourPower.net, Brussels becomes first major city to halt 5G due to health effects. Due to health effects. So, great news. A Belgian government minister has announced that Brussels is halting its 5G plans, at least for now, due to concerns about health effects. The statement was, was made by Celine Framalt, all right, the minister of the government of the Brussels capital region responsible for housing, quality of life, environment, and energy. She must have an awful big uh, business card, I would think, to, to get that whole title on a business card, <laughs> or very small font. <laughs> she says, I cannot welcome such technology if the radiation standards, which must protect citizens, are not respected, 5G or not. The people of Brussels are not guinea pigs whose health I can sell at a profit. We cannot leave anything to doubt. Ms. Formalt accurately identified that the 5G pilot project is not compatible with Belgian radiation safety standards. Uh, which they give you the, the dat data there on uh, that, um, and stated that she does not intend to make an exception. Good. Good for her. Good for her. Perhaps with Brussels heading up the European Union 
And with one of the two major 5G appeals being addressed in the EU, officials are better informed and motivated to protect themselves. Uh, may uh, may support increase what may support increase that doesn't even make sense anyway from from Ms. from all and all officials who are hearing the call to sanity and prioritizing people over technocratic oligarchy technocratic oligarchy <laughs> the 5g situation in summary there is almost no question that a 5g world would place us all under a, an unprecedented level of surveillance and control, granting unheard of powers to soulless corporate algorithms. That should be enough to permanently delete the agenda right there, filed under useful technology gone bad. Uh, though perhaps an even bigger question for our time is, does 5G pose a major threat to all biological life? The independent evidence overwhelmingly indicates that it does. That is, unless you ask wireless industry sources who own the FCC and who recently put out this CNBC propaganda commercial in a thinly veiled attempt to quash the pushback. Uh, the talking heads of the wireless industry brashly admit when forced in a U.S. Senate hearing, that they have not done any safety studies, and they do not plan to. <laughs> the fact is, hundreds of scientists are trying everything to sound the alarm. One such voice is Dr. Martin Paul, a WSU professor emeritus, whose research actually lays out the mechanism of how wireless radiation causes harm in our cells, calls 5G... The stupidest idea in the history of the world. That's saying something. The stupidest idea in the history of the world. Yes, that is 5G. However, within the corporatized halls of government, there is a well-worn pattern of voices of reason being drowned out by the frost frenzy of technocratic corporations who envision 5G as an unprecedented economic opportunity for the full-on commercial exploitation of reality. But the 5G pushback is starting to get viral. The compilation of truths assembled in videos on 5G like this one provide a much-needed reality check on the shocking state of greed and deprivation among the agenda pushers in our world. While it may sound stark after observing this for a long while, to me, it honestly now appears that those pushing this agenda are stuck in a type of hive mind syndrome. So the frenzied with dollar signs and us versus them progress obsessions that they are in a mode incapable of self-corrective thought or, at the very least, incapable of seeing where all of this is obviously heading for them and their kids, too. When the industry sheep are being presented with an avalanche of scientific evidence for a catastrophe in the making, and yet they refuse to listen and instead to continue to tow the profit-pushing line, what becomes visible is the shadow expression of utter disdain for life. That may sound harsh, but I encourage you to consider this deeply. Perhaps it's the global unconscious death wish that is at, the, is at the core of 5G push. Perhaps it's also at the core of the desire to darkly exit the human condition via AI and transhumanism. Apparently, this thought form sees, it, uh, sees its escape and salvation through technology, or salvation, not salvation, salvation through technology instead of through humanity and or our connect, connection with divinity. Do what now? <laughs> All right. In any case, to any sane human with normal values, the situation is indeed bewildering. Though once we get over the distress, uh, we are called into a kind of soul-led response. Perhaps a, it's a first resolve to be sovereign in our thoughts, and to be steward of our own mind. 
the inspiration and true co connectedness come when we become involved in manifesting a bigger solution. All right, you're, you're going into stuff here that's not 5G related. I'll just give the folks the link here on this. But uh, bear in mind uh, that uh, some people are realizing how bad the 5G is. I am live, duh. Are you, do you hear me live, duh? Duh. <laughs> Doesn't have problems connecting to the new stream. And, uh, so I, I gave him some uh, various options. I don't know how he wound up. Um, yeah, salivation, yes. All right, duh. Okay. <laughs> You may no <clears throat> excuse me. You may notice today in a distinct lack of conversation about all things corona. Now you may think, well you just talked about five G. That's corona. Eh yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but but I was giving it to you from an article that was posted that was published well before Corona ever hit the mindset of of man. So um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, that it's done and it it is that way on purpose. I I I don't want to talk about Corona. I'm bored with Corona. I'm disgusted and sickened by Corona. Uh, and and not not by the corona so much itself, but by the agenda behind it and, and the way it's been driving the global totalitarian gubernments uh, to do bad things to people all around the world and how that's going to continue to go and get worse. So I I don't I don't that's why I'm not bleh, talking about it. Anyway, here we go from MiamiNewTimes.com, posted October twenty seventh. 2017. 2017. <laughs> the CIA, the CIA, considered bombing Miami and killing refugees to blame Castro. What? <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> Uh, Donald Trump's bold promises earlier that week to uh, finally blow the lid off the JFK assassination mystery by declassifying reams of secret documents turned out to be nothing. A huge nothing burger. It was just a tease. It was a waste of time. All those JFK documents they released showed abs of freaking nothing new. Freakingly nothing new. The National Archives ended up masking uh, public, uh, making public only a very tiny, minuscule fraction of the JFK documents. Uh, still, the 2,800 papers included in the new document dump confirm some salacious details of America's decades-long quest to kill or dispose, depose, <laughs> I, I can almost read uh, Fidel Castro, including a fairly shocking plan, eh, maybe not so shocking, uh, at least not shocking in today's world, probably very shocking in 1963, but not so shocking today. A shocking plan by the CIA to sow terror in Miami. After Castro's revolution succeeded and thousands of Cubans fled to South Florida, the agency actually considered murdering a boatload of refugees, assassinating exile leaders, and planting bombs in Miami, also Castro could be blamed for the chaos. I think they call that a false flag. <laughs> yes, Moose, you are quite correct. The basic idea was to turn the world opinion against Castro and possibly justify a U.S. military invasion by pinning the atrocities on him. The details of the sinister plot are included in the summary about Operation Mongoose, a 1960 covert op hatched by the CIA under Dwight Eisenhower with the aim of toppling communist Cuba. The campaign was included in a report on pretexts the United States could conjure up to justify military intervention in Cuba. 
The paper was sent by Glenn Edward Lansdale, a top Cold War officer who worked with the CIA to plot out Operation Mongoose. He sent the report, which included nine other pretexts, on April 12, 1962, to General Maxwell Taylor, who would soon become chairman of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff. Here's how the report described the plan. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. The terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees seeking haven in the United States. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. We could foster attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the United States, even to the extent of wounding and instances to be widely publicized. Exploding a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots, the arrest of a Cuban agent, the release of prepared documents substantiating Cuban involvement also would be helpful in projecting the idea of irresponsible government. Now, in 1960, I, I, this, this was probably shocking information, but today it's like standard operating procedure. This is the way they do things. They set up, they create false flags all the time in order to, to further an agenda. And no, I'm not talking about Corona. Although, <laughs> just to reiterate how crazy this idea is, the CIA thought about blowing stuff up in Florida and murdering innocent refugees simply to make Castro look bad. Thankfully, that plot apparently was never carried out. The Mo well, no, but then they did do the Bay of Pigs, so, you know, whatever. Uh, the Mongoose Dock includes other frightening plots hatched by the spooks in Washington, including an idea to use biological weapons to ruin Cuba's crops, possibly leading to famine and an uprising against Castro. They'll destroy an entire nation of people just to go after... One guy. They're, that's what they'll do. Those, uh, <laughs> uh, in, the, in, the, in this paper, he mentioned specifically the possibility of producing crop failures by introducing biological agents which would appear uh, to be of natural origin. Mr. Bundy said he had no worries about such sabotage, which could clearly be made to appear as the result of local Cuban disaffection or of a natural disaster, but we must um, avoid external activities such as the release of the chemicals unless they could be completely covered up. That plan was apparent, also apparently spitballed. Operation Mongoose has hardly been a secret. The covert project, which for a time was headquartered in a secret base in Opalaka, uh, has long been studied for cold, high Cold War scholars and JFK conspiracy buffs. It's not even immediately clear whether the details about sowing terror in Miami are new, though a quick web search doesn't yield any stories about the particular idea. Um, but they did an update on this after they posted that. As some astute readers have noted, much of the newly posted mongoose details at the National Archive were already released as part of Operation Northwoods, which uh, Kennedy reviewed but rejected. So, uh, <laughs> so, so if you don't think that your government, uh, or if you think that your government is beyond reproach, if you think that your government, some, what 2020 NFL draft? That is, this is, how did that get in there? Is that, is that like the next story in line or something? I don't even see how that's even how that's a headline. That's not the headline, guys. <laughs> I don't know where that headline came from. Well, let me let me paste the headline in there. <laughs> that's weird. Um, all right. So uh, there's been a lot a lot of false flags pulled off by your government agencies of your government. Um, and when I say your government, it doesn't matter if you're in the United States or not. It happens uh, in many, many other governments. Probably not all of them, 
Some of them are probably all right, but not so much your government. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Oh, God. All right. Okay. From RT.com, posted February 24th uh, on, uh, 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 yeah, here it is. At least they'll have an off switch, which is what I, you know, uh, when I, when I, when I talk about, uh, uh, sex bots, I, I see that as a huge benefit to having an off switch. You know, a woman, a woman would be great if she had an off switch, <laughs> which I'm sure many of them had said, would have said about me. Uh, but, <laughs> Regardless, at least they'll have an off switch. Pentagon adopts AI ethical principles, ethical principles for its killer robots. And they got a picture of the Terminator here. <laughs> As the United States looks to, looks to develop artificial intelligence weapons to keep up with Russia and China, the Pentagon has adopted a set of guidelines that it says will keep its killer androids under human control. The Department of Def which, if the humans are the same ones writing those CIA proposals, are, are those really humans that you want in control of killer robots? Uh, I don't think so. The Department of Defense adopted a set of ethical principles for AI on Monday, following the recommendations by the Defense Innovation Board uh, last October. AI technology will change much about the battlefield of the future, of the future, but nothing will change America, America's steadfast commitment to the responsible and lawful behavior, Defense Secretary Mark Esper said in a statement. According to the Pentagon, its future AI projects will be responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and... Uh, Governable? <laughs> what does that mean? As the Defense Innovation Board recommended, some of these live or five principles are straightforward. Once you decipher the Pentagon speak anyway, governable, governable, for example, means that humans must be able to flip the off switch. Governable. Are you governable? Are you governed? So, governable means that humans must be able to flip the off switch. They can flip your off switch. That makes you governable. Catch that? They slipped it in here in an article about AI and ethical AI. Governable means <laughs> that, that humans must be able to flip the off switch. Uh, systems that demonstrate unintended uh, behavior, uh, but others are a little more ambiguous. Yeah, what, what exactly the department will do to minimize unintended bias in AI capabilities, as it says it will do to keep these sex systems equitable, is vague. Minimize unintended bias in AI capabilities. Yeah, that's vague. And may cause problems down the line if left undefined. Trusting a machine to scan aerial imagery in search of targets is a legal and ethical minefield. And Google already pulled out of a Pentagon project in 2018 that would have used machine learning to improve the targeting of drone strikes. Such fun. Uh, similarly, the Pentagon, uh, Pentagon's promise that its staff will exercise appropriate levels of judgment and care. The Pentagon, the murder department, the death department, the war department, whatever you want to call them, the Pentagon, those evil bastards, will exercise appropriate levels of judgment and care? Yeah, I don't think so. When developing and fielding these new weapons, yeah. Very meaningless. Very meaningless pledge there. The adoptions of a loose set of ethical principles instead of an outright ban will leave some campaigners unsatisfied. Many leading pioneers of AI, 
such as Demis Hassabas at Google, uh, DeepMind, and Elon Musk at SpaceX are among more than 2,400 signatories to a pledge that outright opposes the development of autonomous weapons. Numerous other open letters and pet petitions against military AI have been filed worldwide in recent years. Problem is, guys, they don't care. They don't care about your concerns. <laughs> Resistance from tech industry uh, presents the Pentagon with a practical dilemma, as well as an ethical one. Despite pumping increasing sums of money into developing AI systems, the United States believes Russia and China are ahead and will extend their lead in this domain if the Defense Department can't recruit the talent needed to compete. Uh, to counter that brain drain, the Trumpster proposed 4.8 trillion uh, 2021 budget. I'm sure you could just print that up, no problem. Uh, which would uh, which would hike the defense, the DARPA uh, funding for AI uh, related research from 50 million to 249 million, and increase the National Science Foundation funding funding from 500 million to 850 million, with 50 million set aside specifically for AI. Whatever devices DARPA comes up with, if this set of guidelines is followed. At least they'll have an off switch operated by some crazy murderous human from the Department of Defense. Yeah, that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right. All right. From lowering lowering the bar dot net, posted on uh, October tenth, twenty thirteen. It's been a while. It's an old article. I had to dig deep to find today's articles, but I did, and I and I came up with this one. <laughs> no, you're still deceased. Judge tells dead man. What? There's a man sitting in the courtroom. He appears to be in good health, noted Judge Allen Davis on Monday. But by the end of the hearing, that man was dead. Yes, he had also been dead when he walked in. Though, so, nothing changed, really. As Ryan Dunn of The Courier reported on Tuesday, way back in that year when this article came out, Donald Eugene Miller Jr., formerly of Arcadia, Ohio, had been declared legally dead in 1994. In fact, Judge Davis was the one who issued that order. After a hearing at which Miller appeared physically in an effort to prove that he was not actually dead, <laughs> Davis ruled that despite this fairly compelling evidence of life, he walked into your court, he sat down, he's talking to you, Fairly compelling evidence of life, in the eyes of the law, Miller would have to stay dead. Sorry, Miller. Donald. <laughs> the reason for this is, uh, if this guy's research is correct, and of course it probably is, Ohio Revised Code Section 2121.01, uh, known as the Presumed Decedents Law, despite the title... The law does not belong to any presumed decedents and certainly does not benefit them in any way. It provides for a presumption of death of a person if he or she disappeared and hasn't been heard from in five years, disappeared and uh, less than five years ago after being exposed to a specific peril or death, or was on active duty in the armed forces and has been declared dead under the Federal Missing Persons Act. Under the law, an interested party can bring an action stating that the necessary facts and asking the court to issue a decree stating the person is presumed dead. The PDL is part of the, the, the state's probate code, and so that, that the typical 
effect is simply to provide that the per the property of the now legally dead person can be distributed as if he or she was in fact dead as a doornail. Willis can can go through probate, real and personal property can be distributed, or well, not Willis, Wills, uh, <laughs> life insurance payouts, and so on. In this case, Miller had been last reported in the uh, Arcadia in 1986 when he, he testified Monday that he had lost his job, decided to look elsewhere for work, and then just kind of went further than I ever expected it to, uh, like to Florida. After he had been missing for eight years, his ex-wife asked for the death decree so her children could get Social Security death benefits, and Judge Davis agreed. According to the report, Miller returned to Ohio in 2005, whereupon his parents informed him that he was dead. Sorry, Sonny, you did! <laughs> He's apparently been okay with that for some time. But the court, <laughs> the court that he would like to, he told the court he would like to be alive again now so that he can get his Social Security card and driver's license back. Sorry, Charlie or Donald. Uh, the Ohio law does not provide for situations, or does provide for situations, which it's later established the presumed, presumed decedent is alive. Which is what Miller was hoping to show by bringing his body to court and proving he was still in it. A death decree can be vacated, at which point the presumed decedent's status is elevated to a a person erroneously presumed to be dead, and he or she uh, then has certain rights to recover property. His ex-wife said she only opposed Miller's motion because she didn't want to have to pay anything back and noted that he owes about $26,000 in child support. Uh, the problem is that the law is pretty clear uh, that this has to be done within a three-year period from the date of the decree. Since 19 is more than three... Sorry, buddy, you're still dead! <laughs> oh, So, yeah... Sometimes being dead is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> all right. Now, if you ever the thought about, you know, I want to be an astronaut, and then you, you, you found out, well, astronauts, you know, they could be up there for whatever amount of time, six months, a year, they don't know. Uh, they, they could be up there for a while, up, up there in space. And all that time, no sex. You can't have sex up there. Wait a minute. Maybe you can. <laughs> on on futurism.com, February 24th. Scientists say, and I don't know why it's unfortunate, but unfortunately, astronauts will need to bone in space. Bone in space. <laughs> As space agencies work to launch uh, crewed missions deeper and deeper into space, they tend to overlook one crucial variable. Astronauts are people, meaning they sometimes get horny. That's the problem presented in an essay published by the Conversation last week, that NASA and other groups are failing to prepare for crew, crew members' human needs. In other words, astronauts may face undue psychological and mental strain due to space abstinence. Space abstinence. <laughs> In order to accommodate astronauts' needs, the conversation essay, essay argues that space agencies should embrace high-tech sex toys, especially AI-enabled sex robots that could act uh, to, out the role of a partner. Astronauts, despite their rigorous training, remain humans with needs, writes the essay, essay's two authors, Concordia University psychology grad student uh, Simon Doob and some other guy, uh, whatever. Because, of, because crew sizes will be extremely limited, they argue human relations 
would be ill-advised due to the low chances people will find a compatible partner and uh, the risk of an awkward breakup. Ergo, sex box. <laughs> the problem is that a growing number of experts are rallying around the idea that sex robots, even with AI-crafted semblances of human personality, are a poor replacement for human partners, at best. I disagree. <laughs> if an astronaut is a digisexual, you got that? New, there's a there's a new uh, uh, what do you call it? Sexual or uh, a Sexual preference, I guess. Digisexual. Regardless, uh, more power to them. But to others, getting an official NASA-issued sex spot before liftoff might make a long journey to space seem even lonelier and uh, psychologically damaging than before. <laughs> oh, digisexuals! <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> so you're working down at the local fast food joint down there, and you're flipping them burgers, and, and you're seeing everybody getting more money than you, and you're saying, hey, 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 I want my share of that $15 an hour. Where's my share of the $15 an hour? I'm going to go outside. I'm going to protest. I'm going to march up and down. I'm going to convince all my workers here at this restaurant and all the restaurants around this town to march for $15 an hour. We deserve $15 an hour. Well, maybe you do, but not there. Not as a burger flipper or other fast food worker. Activistpost.com, February 29th. Burger robot to replace fast food workers with a wage of $3 an hour. <laughs> if your job is working at a restaurant flipping burgers, you may soon find yourself replaced by a robot that works for only $3 an hour. A new robot named Flippy, Flippy, <laughs> developed by Miso Robotics, Miso Robotics costs less to employ than a minimum wage worker. Currently, Miso Robotics charges an upfront fee of between twenty and thirty thousand to install Flippy into restaurants. The LA Times reports: As a result, Miso can offer Flippy to fast food uh, restaurant owners for an estimated two thousand dollars a month uh, on a subscription basis, breaking down to about three bucks an hour. And the actual cost will depend on customer-specific needs. A human doing that same job would cost four to ten thousand dollars or more a month, depending on a, a restaurant's hours and the local minimum wage. And robots never once call in sick. <laughs> According to Digital Trends, Flippy is a burger flipper robot arm that's equipped with both thermal and regular vision, which grills burgers to order while also advising human collaborators in the kitchen when they need to add cheese or prep buns for serving. So you can be a, a cheese and bun filler. <laughs> Probably not at 15 bucks an hour. When Miso Robotics set out to create their first units off-the-shelf robotic arms sold for upwards of $100,000, today they're going for about ten grand and are only getting cheaper, according to LA Times. In 2017, international chain Cali Burger uh, was the first to install Flippy, which can flip 150 burgers an hour. Can you flip 150 burgers an hour? <laughs> anyway. Moving on. <laughs> Just be careful what you wish for. You want your 15 bucks an hour imposed upon your employer? Well, you feel free to, to go ahead and try and do that uh, and see where that gets you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, maybe in your home you're concerned because... You're being watched. You're being monitored. And not just in your home, all over the place, wherever you go. You're being watched and monitored. Um, probably, mostly by your own little cell phone, but also by other devices uh, uh, 
that are out there in public and around cameras and microphones that are implanted into things. Of course, all this 5G nonsense, just things that are monitoring and tracking you. But but would you feel maybe just the slightest, the slightest bit better if you had a way to know what objects were tracking you? Also, televisions, you're correct. Well, your 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 refrigerators, your microwave ovens, your toasters are also part of the Internet of Things that track you. Um, <laughs> well, here you go from Activist Post, February 28th. A new smartphone app, so it's still got to go on your primary tracking device. A new smartphone app lets you monitor the Internet of Things spying devices. Right, most only if they're smart. Smart, not yeah. All right, so so a new app lets you see cameras, Bluetooth beacons, and smart speakers around you and help you opt out of data collection. With an increase of surveillance, like real-time facial recognition technology, throughout the city of London and the United States, also implementing that tech among their other other biometrics in the Hartsfield Jackson Airport in Atlanta, as well as apps like Amazon's Ring and smart devices, there needs to be a way to watch the watchers. Of course, watching the watchers doesn't stop the watchers from watching you, <laughs> but at least you know where they're at. <laughs> no matter where you look, Big Brother has been pushing for the use of surveillance technology, not just the UK from Amazon helping law enforcement, with its facial recognition software, uh, DHS wanting to use it for border control, to the Olympics wanting to, well, that's okay, the Olympics is pushed off for at least a year, wanting to use it for the tech industry, even retail is pushing for the technology as an anti-chef mechanism to be introduced into thousands of stores using biometric facial recognition software from Face First which is how you do a face plant first, to build a database of shoplifters. Some of the biggest airports in the country, estimated at 16 airports across the U.S., are now scanning us as we board their international flights. <laughs> anyway, there's an app uh, that you can download. There's a link in this article here. Uh, and, and so... I, I don't know how helpful it is. Um, I mean, if you download an app to your primary spying device, it tells you all the stuff that's spying on you, but you're still being spied on. So uh, is it better to know or not to know? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all right. And finally, lastly and not leastly, we come to this. We come to this. Welsh butcher, from that's a guy from Wales, Welsh, butcher, fed up, as am I, with vegans naming plant-based foods after meat. So he decided to make giant carrots out of pork. <laughs> the, the pork kebabs are shaped like carrots. Finished with an orange glaze, and even have parsley leaves. Yes, a Welsh butcher fed up with vegans naming plant-based food after meat has gone viral after he created carrots using minced meat and parsley. Tom Samways, the owner of Samways High Class Butchers in Cardigan, uh, said he was so sick of vegan food being named after meat products, he decided to create a meat alternative to the beloved carrot. The root vegetable was rec re recreated uh, using a minced pork meat that was given an orange glaze and finished with parsley uh, to create the leaves. Tom, 36, said the carrots have been, hit, uh, have been a hit with customers. The carrots. <laughs> and, said, and said his shop sold more than 300 on one day alone, on Saturday alone. Everybody loved them, he said. It started out as a bit of a joke. Uh, they were just a gimmick, but they've gone down well, and we'll be making more. Uh, they'll be back on the shelf tomorrow, 
He added, the idea came from the fact that a lot of vegan food is named after meat products, like vegan sausage, vegan chicken, all this impossible crap. I just thought, well, let's make a meat version of vegan food. So he did. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> all right, folks, sorry for the uh, stream interrupt us early in the show, but if you have to listen to the uh, first 20, 30 minutes of the podcast, I don't know how long it went on, um, do that. Then you can catch all the early stories, because I was talking about some good stuff there. Uh, that'll be up shortly. I'll be back again with another episode of Grim Leftovers next Monday evening uh, on the 13th. Monday the 13th! Is there, is there, is there something? Is that like a something bad there going on? Monday the 13th! Oh, all right. <laughs> all right so tomorrow you got the uh the uh in a perfect world with flash and who knows who else and um just check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all the rest of the shows coming up throughout the week you'll be glad you did and anything else i got to tell you wash your damn hands no 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 stay away from people having nothing to do with coronavirus Stay away from people. Have a great week. Peace.